All right, let's take a look at numbers and stats. Remember, the nonfiction signposts, they're just kind of like these clues, um, these markers, these signposts that alert us, the reader, when we're going through a text, that there is a moment that we should pause, that we should think critically about what we're reading. Um, this first one that we're looking at is known as numbers and stats. And when we're alerted to this signpost, we're going to pause, we're going to think critically. And then, of course, we're also going to answer the anchor question, because it's more than just simply noticing, like, there's a number, 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 so on and so forth. We also need to stop and think critically. So let's just take a look here. As we see, when you're reading and you notice specific numbers, number words or amounts, you should stop and ask yourself, why did the author use those numbers or amounts? The answers might help you come to a conclusion, make a comparison, see the details, infer the facts, got the light back on, or recognize evidence. That's what numbers do. They provide us with details to help visualize the point the author is trying to make. So our sign posts is numbers and spat, stats. <laughs> Definition, the author uses specific numbers, number words or amounts. The anchor question when you see them, why did the author use those numbers or amounts? And then the signal words. Um, it's kind of funny because we're looking for numbers here, but in this case, numbers can be words, like the word one, O-N-E, is also the number one. You know what I mean? But our signal words can be any numbers, like the numerals themselves, uh, dates, uh, specific numerical amounts, majority sum, everyone, many, half, several, ratios, percents, all of these, anything related to numbers could all be considered numbers and stats. And so we're going to take a look at a couple of passages together. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to highlight uh, the various numbers and stats that I encounter, and then I'm going to model kind of my thinking about why did the author use those numbers and amounts. So let's take a look at this first passage. Grana and her family had lived in their one-room house for two years. It's one of thousands of mud brick homes in the Shamshatu Afghan refugee camp. The camp holds about 50,000 Afghan refugees. There are a lot of numbers and stats in there, um, but for example, we might see um, Grana and her family lived in a one-room schoolhouse, and so we can just highlight that one room. In this case, one would be the actual number, one-room schoolhouse. Uh, and then we've also got two years. That's another example of a number or a stat. One of thousands is another one that we could highlight. And then, of course, we have the actual number itself, 50,000. Afghan refugees. And so as we do that, we see just in that one little set or two sentences alone, three sentences, we've got four examples of numbers and stats. Now, some of them are spelled out one, two, some of them are numerals, 50,000. Some of them are phrases, one of thousands, but they're all numbers and stats. And every time we encounter them, um, we need to just kind of stop and ask ourselves why. Now, here's the deal. This one has like four sets of numbers and stats in three sentences. That doesn't mean that every time you read, you need to stop and be like, okay, we saw a number. Why did they pick that number? Oh, another number. Why did we pick that number? Oh, another and another and another. You'd be here forever. You wouldn't get through your reading. But you should be, as a conscientious and critical reader, you should be alerted to these things. And it should be almost like spidey senses, right? It should be tingling and be like, ooh, number of stats. Why are they included? So for example, um, I'm not going to type out my answer to the anchor question. Why did the author use those numbers or amounts for all of these? But I'm going to talk through a couple of them. One room, as in a one room house. Why do I suppose the author used that? Well, A, it's probably factually true. But more importantly, I think that they chose to include the fact that it is a one room house for, for a specific reason. Because imagine if they just said, Grana and her family lived in their house for two years. I have no idea what type of house Grana and her family have. Is it a big house? Is it a little house? Uh, is it a nice house? Is it kind of a ramshackle house? But when they describe, when the author chooses to describe it as one room, and they choose to include the fact that it is a one room house, that alerts me that it's probably pretty small and that it's probably um, not great in terms of the amenities and in terms of the space that they have. Um, and then we see that they've lived there for two years. Again, that's factually true. That's probably why the author chose to include it. But the author also is probably trying to prove a point that two years, that's kind of a long time to be living in a one room house. And then we have one of thousands. And what I'm gonna do for one of thousands, I'm just gonna type out, um, Kind of my thoughts, my answer to the anchor question. Why did the author choose to include the phrase one of thousands? And I'm just going to go ahead and type this out.
All right. So now, excuse my typos as I was going through there. I'll fix those. Um, but why do I suppose the author said one of thousands of mud brick homes? Um, well, I'm guessing the author said one of thousands. Again, A, it's true. But more importantly, they really wanted to drive home the point that this refugee camp is just, you know, literally thousands and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of one broom homes, mud brick homes, and they really wanted to paint this picture that it's not just Rana and her family, um, but that they are just one example of many. And I'm guessing that's why they put one of thousands, right? Because again, Grana and her family live in the one room house for two years, camp, da 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 da. Imagine um, it, it paints a more vivid picture of where they live. And so I think that's why they chose to include one of thousands. And in this case, for the passage, that's the one that I'm choosing to answer for the anchor question. Because again, we're not going to answer the anchor question every time we encounter a number stat. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk through this with you. And so let's just talk through the last one. 50,000 Afghan refugees. Again, factually true, but why did the author choose to include it? Uh, I assume to illustrate um, just how massive this concern, this issue is of Afghan refugees in this refugee camp. Now imagine if we reread this passage without the numbers and stats. Greta and family have lived uh, in their house it's one of many mud brick homes in the refugee camp that camp holds many refugees, right? Without those specific numbers and stats, if we try and read it without them, it, it doesn't paint as clear of a picture. And that's why they're important. I'm just gonna, you know, hold your thought on that. I'll be right back. My phone's ringing. And I'm back. Okay, sorry about that interruption. Um, I, I think we probably wrapped up. So let's move on to our next one in terms of numbers and stats. And as we continue to look at our anchor question here, let's take a look at this next one. Passage two, in fact, uh, living, uh, passage two, uh, in fact, nearly half of all bottled water is reprocessed tap water sold at prices up to 3,000 times higher than consumers pay for tap water. So nearly half is a number and stat, right? Those are signal words. And then sold at prices up to 3,000 times, I suppose we could even say 3,000 times higher would probably be the more accurate number in stat than consumers pay for tap water. So there again, as we look at this example, when there are two numbers in stats, nearly half and 3,000 times higher. Why do I suppose the author chose to say nearly half? Again, probably just to illustrate a point. Um, it's just factually correct. There's no bigger meaning there. I don't know. There's not much. Um, as I look at that, it kind of stands out like, wow, half of the water is reprocess tap water, meaning it just comes right out of you know the tap, um, and then sold at prices up to 3,000 times higher than consumers. Um, that one kind of stands out to me, and so I'm just going to answer the anchor question here. All right. So again, excuse my typos. Um, ooh, why? Whatever. Um, I can't spell necessities. We're just going to roll with it because it. Uh, there we go. Oh my gosh. Ooh. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, Three thousand times higher. I believe the water. Believe <laughs> the author wanted to point out how difficult conditions in the camps are, even for basic necessities, right? So it's not just saying the water's expensive or the water's really expensive or the water's really ridiculously super expensive. It's saying. 3,000 times higher than regular old tap water. Like that's a pretty staggering amount. And I believe that's why the author chose to put in the actual number in stat um, instead of just, you know, using some other type of language there. So what your task is going to be now is you are going to read these next two passages. You are going to do as I did, where you're going to highlight the signal words and then choose one or two uh, examples of the numbers and stats per passage and just explain um, your answer to the anchor question, why did the author use those numbers or amounts? So there you go. There's your numbers and stats. Uh, there's a quick overview of the signpost and um, its purpose and what you should do when you, uh, when you encounter different numbers and stats. I hope you're doing well and I will talk to you later. See ya.